What the hell happened to this stage? Did we just walk into an MC Escher painting or what? Not even Escher, it's too colorful and abstract. It's it's like a cross between avant-garde and a Jackson Pollock, jeez. Guess you can never hold it against Namco that they decided to play it safe with a stage design in this game. Hell, if anything, this is unlike anything I've ever experienced in any other platformer. It's awesome. Well, if you don't count the Starry Night levels that were in new... I think it was New Super Mario Bros. U? <laughs> There's been so many, they just kind of blend into each other after a while, you know? I hate to say it, but those games really do. All I can remember is what system they were on anymore. And on that note, what's up everybody, and welcome back to Let's Play Cloa 2, Lunatia's Veil. I, of course, am what the fnew, and in the last episode, I said something that I need to apologize for. Yes, this is not the stage I was thinking of. I was actually thinking of something that happens a little later in this game. In fact, I think it's the stage right after this one that tends to piss me off a little bit. This stage, the Maze of Memories, is in fact a really cool one. It's got great design, it's got some fantastic platforming, it's got very calming meditative music, and if you check this out right down here, notice how they didn't respawn that fire enemy until I got back down from that platform. Because those things have such gigantic hitboxes, they decided not to have me take damage from, some, from a hazard that I didn't even see. It's a really cool little level design. That's just something you never even would have noticed had you not put your game through rigorous beta testing. And I gotta give kudos for that. That's really good hindsight on their part. Now, one other thing I want to talk about in terms of design here, I don't know, is it kind of cliche for me to talk about games as art in this episode, <laughs> considering where we are? But it's something I've wanted to mention for a while. There's an analogy I always give people when it comes to why I love video games more than, like, paintings or movies or things like that. And, well, take a look at this mirror here, and it kind of sums it up. Look at those giant rings floating against that starry sky. That's something you never would have noticed had you never taken the time to stop and look at the details. And if you hadn't, check this out. That ring, along from having the sun, also has the moon on it. You never would have seen that had you not explored the game world, and that in essence is why I love video games. Here's the analogy I always give people, I'm pretty sure I've said that like three times already, but a picture is worth a thousand words, yeah? Well a movie is basically 30 pictures that you view every second for what, about a half, an hour and a half? Now, compare that to video games, which is basically a movie where you decide what sequence of pictures you're seeing at any given time. Now, if I'm doing my math correctly, all of that means that video games have quite a bit to say. There's so many different things you could see in any given work in this medium. So many different things to take in, so many experiences to look at, to digest, and it can there's a very good chance that it couldn't be the same every single time. You write the story yourself in a way. And yes, I know there are things like cutscenes and there's predetermined paths you have to go through the games. I mean, it wouldn't be a game without those things, but I don't know. There's just something really... Like, you look at a picture, you can only see it from one flat angle. I can look at these things on the wall right here, and I can go, yeah, that certainly is a moon surrounded by flowers, that certainly is a bridge over some water, and this certainly is a collection of stars. But a video game, it's dynamic. It's like you're a part of that world. <laughs> part of your... No. But seriously, it's... It's about looking at those pictures the way you want to, about taking them in the way you want to. It's about... Hmm. And there's also that gratifying element of it, when you've earned more pictures to look at, when you've earned more art to see. It's my favorite medium because it's art that talks back to you. It's art that rewards you for basically devoting yourself to it. It rewards you for exploring it, for seeing more, for understanding it and getting better at it. It's a medium, it's an experience that's only possible in this medium. 
You'll hear critics and reviewers talk about this a lot. They'll always praise something that does something unique. They'll always praise games, art, movies, whatever, that does something that feels like it couldn't be possible by any other artist or any or in any other way. And yeah, that's in a nutshell why I love video games. It's something that's unique unto itself. And for me, yeah, I consider it better. Of course, that's just my opinion. I'm sure I'd get plenty of people out there who would tell me why movies are way better than video games or pictures are way better than video games could ever be, but what? well, that's your opinion, and I'm entitled to mine as well. You know, to kind of go against what JonTron says about that whole argument, yeah, people on forums that go, you're entitled to your opinion, you know, he goes, yeah, you are, but you're fucking wrong. <laughs> Ah, well. Oh, man. Yeah, so far the puzzles haven't been too bad in this stage, eh? Just like a standard crystal puzzle here and there. It gets complicated later on. They go all out with one of the crystal puzzles here. Don't get me wrong. This one always screwed me up as a kid. Well, back when I was still figuring this game out. Like, what the optimal path they were trying to get me to take was. This is a cool little mechanic, too, isn't it? Just flipping yourself upside down, completely changing the way you view the entire stage. I'm fascinated about that. I want to know how you program that. Let's see, is that all of them? No, it's not. There's actually one trail of gems left. Sorry. Ah, even today it screws me up. It's like, wait, have I done everything? No. No, in fact, I have not. All right. Now we've grabbed everything in this room. All we have to do is flip and swap. <laughs> flip and swap. That's, that's Generation 2 stop and swap. They had to put a new chip in the Wii U in order to make it happen. That makes me really freaking angry. The fact that Rare flat out set... Have you read that article? Yeah, let me date this episode completely by talking about recent articles and news. Have you read that article about Rare talking about how they don't think fans are interested in their old IPs? Yeah, that's why everybody bitches about it, right? How you guys aren't doing your job and taking advantage of these fantastic ideas that you have just lying around doing nothing. <sighs> you know, Game Trailers actually made a video not too long ago where they were talking about games they wanted to see on the new Xbox One. And the one they mentioned at, I think it was like, it was in the top three. I know that for a fact. But it was... One of them was Banjo-Tooie, and it was really high up there, or just Banjo-Kazooie. Banjo-Tooie's the sequel. That's not a franchise. <laughs> you know what I meant. <laughs> and isn't it really hard to follow my brain sometimes? I guess that's the thing that's both unique and frustrating about my commentary, and I've talked about this before, how I work on, like, a chain of thought. Basically, one thing reminds me of another thing, and I just cycle through my brain until I land on something that I think is interesting enough to add to the conversation. Now, the upside to this is I presumably always have something interesting to talk about. Downside to this is it's really hard for people to follow where I'm going sometimes. Like, let's say there are some kids on the playground talking about yellow, the Yellow Submarine, that song. We all live... Yeah, I don't want to get copyright strikes or anything, so that's all you're going to get out of me. Uh, Yellow Submarine makes me think of, Beatle, of the Beatles. When I think of Beatles, just the word, it reminds me of the... It reminds me of bugs. If I think of bugs, I think of this beautiful yellow butterfly I saw the other day. Massive, gigantic butterfly. And I finally, I think that's interesting enough to talk about. That's something I know enough about that I can hold a conversation about. And I mention it to these kids. Oh yeah, I saw this amazing butterfly the other day. And they all look at me like, how the hell did you settle on that thought? You know? <laughs> um, so, yes, sorry. Getting, <laughs> that was a friggin' tangent. Going back to Rareware. Mm. Yeah, the GT. They mentioned that they would love to see a new Banjo-Kazooie game, but I don't agree. Rare may still be a company that exists, but it's not the same people. It's not the same driving force that was behind those games. They could make Banjo-3, yes, but 
it wouldn't be Banjo 3. I mean, think about this. They did do Killer Instinct, but that wasn't rare. That was Double Helix. And for all intents and purposes, that's a company that should not have made a good game, but they did. And I'm so sad I can't talk about more of this company's failures, but this is the end of the stage, and once you see this cutscene, you'll understand why I'm going to be quiet. Come, Lola. Come, Lola. 